he appointed judges in the land, in each of the fortified cities of Judah. He told them, Consider carefully what you do, because you are not judging for mere mortals, but for the Lord, who is with you whenever you give a verdict. Now let the fear of the Lord be on you. Judge carefully, for with the Lord our God there is no injustice, or partiality, or bribery. The second book of Chronicles, chapter 19, verses 5 through 7. Verses like this complicate the already daunting task of understanding ancient texts. The original versions of the translated term judge exemplifies why first impressions of centuries-old manuscripts can be very deceiving. While the English version of the Hebrew Bible calls them judges, the Hebrew word shafat has a much broader meaning. It refers not to an administrative member of a court of law that renders verdicts on legal issues, but to a leader that guides and teaches. This meager yet paramount detail hangs over the reading of the subsequent passages. Religious texts are the only ancient material widely read by the average person on the street. Their social dynamic isolates them from their contemporary scripts, as the latter are usually found in dedicated libraries and in the hands of historians and archaeologists. Even the highly detailed, scholarly, and critical published versions of most ancient manuscripts occupy a niche market of fellow academics and enthusiasts. Thus, the ubiquity of most religious texts offer a fair set of problems. For instance, the presupposition on the reader's part. In the whirlwind of linguistics and subjective interpretation, the search for truth, one that goes beyond historicity or rhetoric, becomes complicated. To understand the various aspects of this topic, historical and otherwise, we will venture from broad ideas to critical opinions. The first form of governance that the Jews established upon their arrival in Canaan was a confederation of twelve loosely connected tribes. The only central authority for this confederation was their monotheistic belief in God, whom they called Yahweh. The twelve tribes were connected by their faith in God and nothing more. They routinely held councils with each other to work out problems, but they were mostly on their own and they governed the different sections of Canaan separately. Around 1000 BCE, certain leaders, called judges, emerged who judged Israel when rulings were needed. These judges were local leaders who were given the power to adjudicate and make determinations when issues arose in the land. They served as military and religious leaders, priests, and prophets. They were not necessarily monarchs. Their authority was often recognized by more than one tribe, but it was not enough to unite all the tribes. The most famous judges mentioned in the Old Testament's Book of Judges, a significant source of information on the topic, were Othniel, Shemgar, Deborah, Gideon, Tola, Jair, Jephthah, Ibzin, Abdon, Ehud, Elan, and Samson. Of these judges, Western audiences are no doubt most familiar with Samson, who was known for being the great warrior seduced by Delilah. Although this judge's larger-than-life story seems almost too unreal to believe, some recently unearthed archaeological evidence, such as the so-called Seal of Samson, seems to support the claim that Samson did indeed exist. This confederation of tribes, stewarded by judges, lasted for several years before the prophet Samuel was commissioned by God to find a man who would be king of all the people of Israel. The Jews had always lived in an unfriendly environment and now they were surrounded by the Philistine city-states and other equally hostile kingdoms. The disjointed tribes were incapable of resisting such forces. The Israelites needed a king to unify and lead them to victory since the judges could not. Here, we arrive at an exciting query. Are there more than 12 judges? Does a judge have to be identified explicitly to enter the canon, or do the wise tribal leaders from the era automatically qualify? For instance, Joshua and Samuel are often considered judges, both offering a leading role in guiding their people through tough times. But when talking about the twelve judges of ancient Israel, we generally restrict ourselves to the tales of the judges that appear in the Book of Judges. The book has been a fascinating topic of scholarly dispute, with many historians questioning its integrity as a historical source. However, as things stand, we do not have a more detailed authority on the judges of ancient Israel if they existed, that is. According to the Hebrew Bible, the first explicitly mentioned judge is Othniel. Othniel is Caleb's brother or nephew. Caleb was one of the twelve spies sent to find Canaan. Caleb's daughter, Aksa, had been betrothed to the conqueror of Debir, and when Othniel fulfilled the task, they were wed. 
The story of Othniel describes him leading the Israelites out of the oppression of King Cushan Rishathan. After eight years of subjugation, Othniel delivers the people from the depths of hell and guides them into an epic of peace that would last for 40 years. After Othniel's death, the Israelites fell into their old ways. Sin became the folly of society. God punished them by placing Moabites over them, but the wrath of God eventually turned to affection, and he sent Ehud, the second judge, to deliver them from evil. Ehud met with the Moabite king under the guise of tribute, only to stab him with a concealed weapon. He would go on to rally his people to rebel against the oppression, and peace would prevail for 80 years after his death. Chapter 3, verse 31 of Judges offers some information on the aftermath. After him came Shamgar, the son of Anath, who struck down 600 Philistines with an ox goat, and he also saved Israel. Shamgar, the third judge, is not well documented in the Old Testament. In another verse, he is said to have traveled when the highways were abandoned and the travelers took winding paths. Most scholars think the name of Shema, one of King David's three mighty men, was corrupted in some instances. Next on our list is the only female judge, Deborah. After Ehud's reign, Scripture tells us that the people of Israel did evil. As a result of their mischief, Jabin, the king of Canaan, ruled over them for 20 years. Then came Deborah, who told Barak, son of Abinoam, to lead the troops. Upon her orders, Barak massacred the army of Sisera, including Jabin's lead commander. Having defeated the Canaanites, the people witnessed another 40 years of peace. The fifth chapter of Judges features the Song of Deborah, considered one of the earliest texts of Hebrew poetry. Gideon, the most prominently featured judge in the book of Judges, is never explicitly referred to as a judge. Nevertheless, his significance cannot be understated. Gideon's era mentions one of the common themes of the Old Testament, the sinful practice of idolatry. The people had started to worship Baal, so Gideon tore his idols down. Like the previous judges, Gideon led the Israelites against their oppressors, this time the Midianites. Once again, there was peace for 40 years. You may have noticed the persistence of 40 years and the structural theme of sin, deliverance, sin as consistent patterns. This forces academics to suspect the chronology of the judges or its entire premise. Tola, like Shamgar, makes a brief appearance in the Old Testament. However, his story follows a pattern similar to the rest of the judges. He rose to save Israel from impending doom. He lived in Shamir, the hill country of Ephraim, and judged Israel 23 years. Then he died and was buried in Shamir. His successor judge, Jair, gets a similar treatment. Three verses about Jair follow the two verses about Tola. They say, Jair the Gileadite arose and judged Israel 22 years. Indulging in sinful behavior prompts yet another tyrannical rule. The Ammonites yielded power over the Israelites for 18 years before the next judge came to their rescue. Jephthah, the son of a harlot, came back from exile and becomes the chief of Mizpah. He vowed to give anything in exchange for a victory over the Ammonites. So, after he was successful in his conquest, God made him sacrifice his daughter. An interesting aspect of the sacrifice of Jephthah's daughter is its contrast with Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac. Some imply that the people of Israel were so morally wayward in their ways that God rejected their pleas for help. Whereas Abraham's righteousness and unwavering loyalty to God saved his child, the Israelite way of life doomed the daughter of Jephthah. The next judge was Ibsen, who is only mentioned in passing. Now Ibsen of Bethlehem judged Israel after him. He had 30 sons and 30 daughters, whom he gave in marriage outside the family, and he brought in 30 daughters from outside for his sons and he judged Israel seven years. Then Ibsen died and was buried in Bethlehem. The next judge, Elan, receives even less of a mention. The Judges, chapter 12, verses 11 and 12, read, Now Elan the Zebulunite judged Israel after him, and he judged Israel ten years. Then Elan the Zebulunite died and was buried at Aijalon, in the land of Zebulon. Abdon, the next judge in the list, also receives little notice, despite having led Israel for eighty years. The Hebrew Bible claims that he had 40 sons and 30 grandsons. After a sustained lack of attention toward three judges, we arrive at Samson, the last and perhaps the most popular of the 12 judges and one of the more fascinating people in the Bible. His mother had been unable to conceive until an angel told her she would. The angel had instructed her not to cut his hair, 
which would later be the source of his supernatural abilities and inevitable downfall. Samson tore a young lion from limb to limb and found beehives inside the carcass. He ate the honey and came upon a riddle he communicated to his contemporaries. In Judges chapter 14, verse 14, the puzzle is expressed as, Out of the eater came something to eat, and out of the strong came something sweet. The people threatened his wife, who provided them with the answer, so Samson left her. Due to further disputes with his in-laws, he burned the fields of the Philistines. The Philistines killed his wife and her family and set out to kill him. The Israelites tied him up and offered him to the Philistines. At the moment of exchange, Samson found a fresh jawbone of a donkey, so he reached out and took it and killed a thousand men with it. God provided him with a spring of water to ease his body. Then he traveled to Gaza, where his reputation had preceded him. The townsfolk offered Delilah money to find his weakness. After overcoming some initial hesitation, he told her about his hair. She cut his hair while he was sleeping, and the Philistines pounced on him. During a Philistine ceremony where Samson was bound and shackled, he asked God for strength. God gave him enough strength to bring the temple down, killing himself and the Philistines inside. It makes for an exciting tale, but one could easily see why some people might roll their eyes at it in terms of historical accuracy. Judges mentions 12 people who judged Israel, but it also accounts for the story of Abimelech, who is not referred to as a judge who behaves similarly. Other texts of the Old Testament provide other names who took on similar responsibilities – Joshua, Eli, Amariah, Zebediah, Samuel, and his sons. Some people claim that the historicity of the judges does not align with the chronology of Israelite history. Various scholars have offered different chronologies to try to make sense of the Book of Judges. Most estimates place the events of the book between the 15th and the 11th century BCE. How would you like to get a deeper understanding of history? impress your friends, and predict the future more accurately based on past events. If this sounds like something you might be into, then check out the brand new Captivating History Book Club by clicking the first link in the description. To learn more about Israel, check out our book, The Kings of Israel and Judah, a captivating guide to the ancient Jewish kingdom of David and Solomon, the divided monarchy, and the Assyrian and Babylonian conquests of Samaria and Jerusalem. It's available as an ebook, paperback, and audiobook. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this.